We're in the second week of our Family 2.0 series. And in the series, it's not necessarily we're trying to upgrade the family, maybe reboot the family to get it back to the way God initially intended the family to operate. That's what we're talking about. This week, we're going to talk about how to overcome uh, the background of a dysfunctional family. And uh, someone came up to me after the last service and says, wow, that was hard. That was painful. I said, you ought to have to sit through it four times like I do, or Bob, our sound guy. I mean, you, we don't pay that guy enough. I'll tell you that right now. But to do this, we're going to look at probably the most dysfunctional family in the Bible. It's the family of Joseph. But I want to say this. This is a story of hope. Because the story we're going to look at encourages us that we do not have to live out our lives as a victim of our past, a victim of our environment, a victim of our circumstances. We're going to learn that, that there is hope. We're going to learn it from the story of Joseph. Uh, let's begin by meeting this dysfunctional family of Joseph. Uh, the first name, and I'm going to go through this step by step, and it's going to seem a little crazy for a while. The first name that we need to become acquainted with is Jacob. Jacob is the, is the daddy in the story. And if you're new to the Bible, there's probably a lot you don't know about this man. Uh, for example, later on, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. You've probably heard that. That says something about this guy. Israel means prince with God. Uh, Jacob, uh, that's, a, that's an upgrade because Jacob means chiseler. It means deceiver. And it goes back to the relationship he had with his brother Esau. You pr may remember that from uh, Sunday school. If, if you don't remember it, you can read about it in Genesis 25, 26, and 27. But as we're going to see this weekend, not only was Jacob a deceiver, he is the classic passive preoccupied father. He is the classic illustration of a man who was just too busy for his family. He was too preoccupied. He was too unconcerned. Uh, he was too passive to deal with his kids, and there's some negative results that come out of this. So Jacob, the dad. The second character is actually not a member of the family, but he plays a key role. His name is Laban. And initially, Jacob and Laban, they begin their relationship as co-workers. They work together. But this is where this begins to sound a little bit like a Jerry Springer episode, okay? Because it's while they're working together that Jacob discovers that Laban has two daughters. His oldest daughter's name is Leah. His youngest daughter's name is Rachel. Now, I want you to hear how the Bible describes these two. Genesis chapter 29, beginning in verse 17, Leah had weak eyes. And if you read that, you would think she's got poor vision. But literally, that is a Hebrew colloquialism. It means she was hard on the eyes. She wasn't much to look at. She may have great personality, but, you know, she probably wasn't going to get by on her looks. But notice the contrast. Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful, right? Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I will work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So Jacob goes to Laban and says, you know, that, that young one, she's a cutie. I will work for you seven years. By the way, that was the, that was the custom in those days. You know, even with, as Beyonce says, you didn't get away by just putting a ring on it. So you, you worked for the girl you wanted to marry. You worked for her dad for seven years. It showed the commitment. And Laban, understanding this story, he is thrilled to death to get such a deal for Rachel. But deep down inside, as a father, he knows that Leah, she's going to be tough to unload. So he begins to think about, how can I take advantage of this situation? Because I can always get rid of Rachel, but what can I do with Leah? And this is what he decides, and you just got to read the story for yourself. Laban ends up switching daughters on the wedding night. So Jacob, who thinks he's getting ready to, to consummate the wedding with Rachel, ends up with Leah. Now you say, Mike, how could that possibly happen? Tradis, tradition, customs, the way they did things, veils, too much wine at the reception, I don't know, dark tent. But the next morning, Jacob is in for a real surprise when the sun comes up because he looks next to him and it's like, ah, I married the one with the personality, right? And where is Rachel? And, and you can understand how upset he is, right? Because he is now married to Leah. So he goes to find Laban and you think he's going to do a beat down on him, but that's not what he does. He says, okay, I have Leah. I will accept her as my wife, but I'm head over heels in love with Rachel. So I will work seven more years so that I can marry Rachel. Understand, though, he's still married to Leah. And during this second seven-year stretch, while he's trying to win over Rachel, he's still married to Leah, and he has seven children with Leah. Six boys and a girl. A girl's name is Dinah. And then finally, seven years later, Jacob marries Rachel. Think about this competition. Two sisters married to the same dude. On top of that, you've got one who's already given Jacob seven children, 
And yet now you have Rachel, and if you read the story, she is unable to conceive. By the way, the greatest stigma for a Jewish woman in the, in the Old Testament was the inability to have children. And so there's this competition, there's this stress. And, and Rachel, she prays and she pleads that God would allow her to have a child. Finally, she becomes pregnant, and she gives birth to Joseph. He's our star. Now understand, by the time Rachel gives birth to, to, to Joseph, Jacob is an old man, and that's probably one of the reasons he loved Joseph as much as he did, because when Joseph was born, it was as if it gave Jacob a new lease on life. Now, I'm not sure that would be my response if I had found out Laura was pregnant at my age, but it worked for Jacob, okay? So they're going to go with it. By the way, just to complicate the story a little bit more, you got Jacob who's married to two sisters. He also has two more wives. They're second class wives. They're what's called in the Bible as a concubine. And they're basically just there to do wifely duties. So he has four wives. By the way, husbands, do not go home today and say, honey, it's in the Bible right there. A concubine it says I can have one. It's just not going to go over that well for you, right? So he has Rachel. He has Leah. He has two concubine wives named Zilpha and Bilha. Sounds like a couple of clowns from the circus, right? But all together, all he needs is Harpo. If he could just marry Harpo, right? But he has four wives. Well, about this time, Jacob, he decides, I have had it for working for Laban, my father-in-law. I've worked 14 years. And, of course, Laban deceived him, which is, you know, what goes around comes around because Jacob's name means deceiver. And so there's all this bad blood and there's this tension in the relationship. So Jacob decides, I've had enough of this. He decides, I'm going to pack up my family. I'm going to pack up my clan, my four wives and all my children. And I'm going to move back to Canaan. That's, that's my roots. So he makes the journey. When he arrives back in Canaan, there are several tragedies that begin to unfold that contribute to the dysfunction of this family. For example, first of all, while they're making their way back to Cana, Dinah, which is a daughter from Leah, Jacob's only daughter, she's raped in the land of Shechem. Now just file that away. Just keep it in mind because it comes back to play in this story. And if you read chapter 34 of Genesis, you discover that when Jacob hears about it, he does nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. But you got to remember, Dinah has six brothers, and their attitude is, hey, if dad's not going to do something about what happened to Dinah, we're going to take matters into our own hands. So these six brothers, they go down to the city of Shechem, they loot the city, they take all the livestock, they kill every man in the city of Shechem. When Jacob hears about it, He's more concerned about his image. He's more concerned about his reputation as being the new guy back in Canaan than he is the fact that his daughter was raped and the behavior of his six boys. But that's not all. There's another tragedy. Go from Genesis chapter 34 to Genesis chapter 35. Rachel becomes pregnant with her second child, and she gives birth to a second son. His name is Benjamin. But during the birth, Rachel, this woman that Jacob loved at first sight, this woman that Jacob had worked 14 years to have the opportunity to marry. This one who had given Jacob his favorite son, Joseph. She dies during childbirth. But it's not all. A few verses later, Jacob discovers that one of his sons, Reuben, who happens to be his oldest son, his firstborn of Leah, he finds out Reuben, his son, is having an affair with Bilhah, his stepmom, which also means she's the mother of two of Reuben's half-brothers. Do you see now why I say it's like a Jerry Springer episode, right? And again, Jacob does absolutely nothing about it. Just as he did absolutely nothing when he heard that Dinah had been raped. Just as he did absolutely nothing when he heard about the behavior of his six boys down in Shechem. In fact, you can read it, the whole story in Genesis, and this is what you'll discover. You'll never read of Jacob dealing with anything. He was your classic passive father. No spine whatsoever. And when we finally get to Genesis chapter 37, Jacob is now back in the land of Canaan. He's got 12 sons and a daughter by four different wives. And I, I wanted to put the family tree together so you could see it. Let's just, so you got Jacob. He, but remember, God changed his name to Israel. And he worked for seven years to marry Rachel, but he ended up with Leah. So he worked seven more years and he married Rachel. During the seven years while he's working for Rachel, he has seven, six boys and one daughter. And then on top of that, he has two concubines who also had four sons by Jacob. And then Rachel finally gave birth to Joseph, the favorite, the star. And then she gave birth to Benjamin. And she died during birth to Benjamin. So Rachel's gone. And then Reuben has an affair with his stepmom. There you go. That's the family in a nutshell. Do you think it could be any more screwed up? And it's not hard now to think, here we have 12 boys from four different moms. It's, it's not hard to imagine the rivalry and the competition that's occurring within the rank of these 12 boys. And if you read the story, you find out the 11 of them responded to this. 
They responded to the negativity from their dad, the, lack, the fact that their dad didn't love them. I mean, these are, like, these are like the bad boys of Canaan, okay? They're wearing black leather jackets, riding Harleys all over Canaan, just disrupting everything. And then you've got Jacob's favorite, goody-goody Joseph, right? Now, the 11, they may be out of control, but they're not stupid. They can tell that dad has a favorite. The dad has one that he loves more than the rest of them. And of course, you know, as you would assume, they're not very happy with Joseph. So let's pick up the story, Genesis 37, verse 3. Now Israel, God's already changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. We talked about that earlier. And he made an ornate robe for him. Now, when we were growing up, that was the coat of many colors, right? Jacob and his technicolor coat. It literally, the Hebrew is ornate. This is an accurate transla uh, translation. But it literally was a sign of nobility. So he gives him this ornate robe that's a sign of nobility. Jacob, I don't know, maybe he goes to Nordstrom and he has this beautiful coat just like tailor-made for Joseph and gives it to him, right? Meantime, the other 11, you know, they're shopping off the rack at Kmart. You got all this tension going on. And it says in verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, and, and Jacob, if you read the story, he doesn't even try to hide it, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So they hate him. Joseph. But it gets more complicated because Joseph has a couple of dreams that he feels like, I got to share these with the family. And if he didn't have trouble before with his brothers, trust me, this did the trick. He has this dream, puts on his special robe, calls the brothers together and says, hey, brothers, I had a dream. In my dream, we were out in the field. We were working together like a family. We were binding sheaves together. And in the dream, my sheaves stood tall. Your sheaves, they were much smaller. And in my dream, your sheaves bowed down to me. And the brothers are standing there, totally perplexed, thinking, what has Joseph been smoking, right? They have no idea what Joseph's talking about. So Joseph says, let me interpret the dream. And you're going to see, Joseph was gifted this way. He says, this is what the dream means, brothers. One day I will rule over all of you. And you will submit to me. In fact, one day you will bow down in a humble expression of your obedience to my authority. How cool is that? You got to be happy for me, right? Well, you know that went over like a lead balloon. But that's, that's, that, if that wasn't enough, Joseph has a second dream. Verse 9. He had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And maybe Jacob's like, well, hang on a second. Let me get this straight, Joseph. I'm just guessing. Am I the sun in your dream? And Joseph's like, that's it, Dad. You're the sun. And your mom's the moon? Yep. And your 11 brothers, stars? That's right, Dad. And we're, we're all bowing down to you? Yep. You got it. And I'm, Jacob's like, wow, son, I love you to death, but I'm getting a little concerned about you. You know what I mean? So verse 11, it says his brothers were jealous of him. The understatement of the Bible, they absolutely hated him. And you can see why in this family, this dysfunctional family, we're set up for some major family conflict. And part of it's God's fault, to be honest with you, for giving Joseph the dreams. I mean, you can't really hold Joseph responsible for that. Part of it's Jacob's fault because he made it very obvious that he loved Joseph more than he loved the other, lo uh, uh, the other 11. I said lovers, but I guess he has so many wives, it doesn't really matter, does it, in this one, right? Part of it was Joseph's fault because he kept having these dreams and going back and telling the brothers, hey, one day you're going to bow down to me. I mean, there's, a, there's plenty of blame to go around. And everything comes to a head when you get to chapter 37, verse 12. Now the brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. I told you to keep that in mind. But Joseph isn't with them. Where's Joseph? He's back home with dad playing Xbox or something. I don't know. And while they're playing Xbox, Jacob's like, hey, Joseph, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go down to Shechem, check on your 11 brothers and see how they're doing. Now, why would he do that? Because Jacob remembers, oh, yeah, Shechem was the place where Dinah was raped. It's the place where my boys caused all of that chaos. And so Jacob is thinking, I bet those people in Shechem, I bet they've had a chance to regroup. And I bet they're still ticked off over the way my boys handled that situation. And so he's afraid there's going to be some retaliation against his sons. So he sends Joseph out to Shechem to check on his brothers. That sets up the scene. We get to Genesis 37, verse 18. But they, the 11 brothers, saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So they're sitting there. They're just doing what dad sent them out to doing. They're watching the flocks and off they can see the silhouette. And they recognize Joseph because one, his gait, but one, he's 
wearing his ornate robe of nobility. And you can imagine how that conversation went down. Look at him. I hate him. Doesn't he make you guys sick? I mean, he's dad's favorite. He gets everything. We get nothing. Da, da, da. They're having this conversation, and one thing leads to another. And before you know it, they're talking about, we ought to just get rid of daddy's pet once and for all. We're out here in the middle of nowhere. No one will ever know. So you look at verse 23. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they'd come up with a plan. We'll get his robe. We'll rip it to shreds. We'll kill an animal. We'll cover the, ro the, the robe with the blood of the animal. We'll take it back to dad and say, dad, we just found his robe. Evidently, an animal got to him, right? And they took him and threw him into the cistern, the pit. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Now, you got to get this picture. Joseph's like buck naked over here in this pit, okay? And the brothers decide in verse 25, read it on your own. I'm hungry. They decide to have lunch. So one of them runs down to Bojangles and comes back with a big old box of chicken and some sweet tea. And I mean, they're just chowing down. Meantime, Je Joseph's in the pit. Hey, guys, I can hear you. Get me out of here. This isn't funny anymore. I tell you what, when I get out of here, I'm going to tell dad. I mean, it's all going down. And the brothers are like, hey, do you guys hear anything? I don't hear anything. And they're just, you know, eating on a chicken wing, right? And as they're sitting there enjoying their lunch, they look out on the horizon and they spot these slave traders heading to Egypt. And it's like the light bulb comes on. Verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, hey guys, what will we gain if we just kill him? And we cover up his blood. And the brothers are thinking, well, that's kind of true, you know. Judah's got a point. If we just kill him, we don't really benefit from that. Maybe there's a way we can leverage this for our good. Verse 27, Judah says, come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, mercy kicks in. After all, he is our brother. In other words, guys, let's don't kill him. That's just wrong. Let's just sell him into slavery, make a little money off of him, right? Obviously, Judah has the gift of mercy. Verse 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Now, this is not the end of the story, but I want to just push pause. And I'll come back to it in a few minutes. But as we push pause, understand Joseph is heading off to a life of slavery in Egypt. But I want, I want you to understand why. It's, it, it's the result of a passive father. It's the result of an absent mother, she died early. It's the result of a bunch of kids who were left on their own to figure out life for themselves. All the necessary ingredients for a dysfunctional family. And some of you are thinking, hmm, absent mom, passive father? Sounds like my home. So I decided in the time that remains this weekend, I, I left a little extra time. I want to make a few applications in regards to our imperfect families. And here's the question I want to ask you. Where are you in the story? Because I can tell you, every one of us here this weekend, we're somewhere in the story. And, and first, I want to address our role as children, our role as kids. I was speaking last night. My mom and dad are, were here, 86 and 83. I'm still their kid, right? They call and check on me. How am I doing? Are you behaving? Those kinds of things. I still respect and honor them. But what about our role as kids? Here's the first application. Some of you, and maybe you're still younger, maybe you've grown up into an adult, some of you can identify with Joseph. As a kid, you wore the robe. You know who you are. <laughs> you were mom's favorite, dad's favorite. Maybe you, you were the favorite of both, you know. Maybe you were an only child and, and everything just revolved around you, but now you're an adult and as a result of everything revolving around you, when somebody comes along who's smarter than you, or more powerful than you, or maybe more attractive than you, you can't even deal with it. And it's because, hey, you like being the one who wears the robe. And you don't want anybody else wearing the robe. You need to wear the robe. Now, if that describes you, and you're going to have to be honest enough to say, yeah, that could be me, I would encourage you, here's the principle, to intentionally put yourself in places where you're not always the center of attention. You got to be used to not wearing the robe. You got to get used to that. So you got to figure out, how do I put myself in situations where I can learn not to be like that? And let me just tell you, this whole idea of serving could be very important to your personal and spiritual development. Think about it. This is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. He says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're looking for an example to follow, here's your guy, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, something to be held on to. But he made himself nothing. Do you know what, you know what that means? That means he, he set aside some of his rights 
as God. Some of his attributes as God. I guess if we relate it to the story, we, could, we would say he set aside his robe of nobility, taking the very nature of a servant. Now let me just say something to those of you who wore the robe and maybe are still wearing the robe. I'll, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about, about you that no one else will tell you. But I can tell you because I get paid to tell you and I have security. So I can tell you. This is what I want you to know. A lot of us don't like you. I'll tell you why. If you're used to wearing the robe, you probably have a sense of entitlement. You're probably a little bit obnoxious. I guarantee you you're high maintenance and spoiled. And if you're married to someone who spent their life wearing the robe, you know what, you, you want to say amen, but you can't. So you just got to sit there and be quiet because <laughs> they'll take that robe off and beat you with it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know they have unrealistic expectations. And as the spouse, no matter what you do, it is never enough. Now, let me tell you something. If you're wearing the robe, we, the rest of us, we would love to do nothing more than to sell you into slavery. We would love to do that, but it's illegal. We can't. We can't. So I would encourage you, take it on yourself to become a servant. Find a place where you can put the needs of other people ahead of your own needs and let God begin to work in your life. I'm telling you, it will do wonders for your personal, emotional, and your spiritual development. That's if you wore the robe. Now, many of you can identify with the 11 brothers. You never wore the robe. You never received the kind of affirmation. You never received the kind of love from your parents you felt you deserved. You know. You, you never had that sense that maybe you were, I don't know, prized and valued. And so no matter what you did, it wasn't enough. You couldn't study hard enough. You couldn't perform enough. You couldn't do enough. And, and maybe reasons you'll, you'll never know, you'll never figure out what the bottom was, it's as, it's as if you always took the back seat. Here's my principle for you. Acknowledge the hurt of never having worn the robe. By the way, I'm a little emotional. It has nothing to do with that. We were so poor, none of us had robes, okay? I mean, that's just life. But I was just thinking about some conversations I had earlier today. Acknowledge the hurt of never having worn the robe. You see, I believe at the root of the brother's hate for Joseph, really wasn't Joseph. I think it was probably nothing more than just hurt directed at dad for not being loved by dad. And I think we all know sometimes it's just easier, sometimes it's just safer to be angry than it is to express hurt and decide I'm going to actually deal with the issue. But I would really encourage you, instead of just being angry and frustrated and hurt and bitter, maybe it's time to have that conversation with the family. Now, let me just say something here. Before you do, there's something you really seriously need to do, and that's need, you need to bathe it in prayer. You need to pray, first of all, God, make sure that my attitude is right going into this conversation, because if your attitude is to get a pound of flesh, or I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna finally say what I've been wanting, it's not gonna work. So first of all, pray for your attitude and then begin to pray, God, work in the heart of my parents before I had this conversation. Because this is what I've learned over years of having to have hard conversations in ministry. Sometimes timing is much more important than content. So pray, God, give me the right timing. Help me to be, help me to be tuned in to when your spirit's moving. Maybe the best way to break the ice is, is by writing a letter. But you need to acknowledge the pain of not receiving the love that you felt like you longed for and you needed. And maybe, maybe your parents don't know how to do it, but maybe, they, maybe they're looking for an opportunity to apologize and maybe get a fresh start. Or maybe they look at it totally different from their perspective. And if that's true, you know what? You could be the issue. And maybe you need to listen to their perspective. But I'm telling you, this could be the first step toward reconciliation. Now, here's the big question. This is what keeps us from doing this. What if it doesn't work? 
What if I put my neck out there? I walk out there, you know, on that limb, like, hey, let's resolve this so we can move on as a family. And they just laugh at you. And there is no reconciliation. There is no admission of wrong. Their attitude is, you got problems. You need to get help. You need to get counseling. What do you do in that situation? If it's just like talking to the wall, here's your next option. It's your only option. You forgive. And you forgive as God in Christ Jesus forgave us. That's what Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians. And how did God in Christ Jesus forgive all of us when we came to him and asked for forgiveness? He forgave us totally and he forgave us unconditionally. Done. Now I'm telling you why you're reluctant to do that. Because when someone has hurt you, there's this sense that they stole something from you. They're indebted to you. They owe you something. Right? And if you, let, if you just forgive them and let it go, it's almost like I let them off the hook. They owe this debt to me, and I've just kind of wiped the debt free. Well, actually, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. That's why Jesus, when he was once talking about forgiveness, this is the terminology he used. Terminology he says, you got to cancel the debt. This is not a, it's not about letting your parents off the hook or maybe letting your child off the hook. It's about saying, I refuse to go through the rest of my life enchained to my past, my anger, my bitterness. So I'm choosing to cancel your debt. Because the reality is, if you ask yourself, how could they ever repay it anyway? Can you go back and relive your childhood? Can, can you go back and they now create for you that home that all your friends had, but you didn't get to have, right? You can't do it. So unless you forgive, cancel the debt. I'm just, I'm just telling you as a friend now, okay? You will drag that hurt, that pain, that bitterness into the future, into every situation, every relationship that you're involved in. And eventually, it will take its toll on that situation, that relationship. You see this in the story of Joseph. Remember, let's push play again. Carried off into a life of slavery in Egypt. And sure enough, he became a slave in the house of a guy named Potiphar. He was 17. Mrs. Potiphar thought he was hot. And every day she tried to seduce him, try to lure him into bed, you know, and he would have nothing to do with her because he was a man of integrity, even at 17. So one day she grabbed him like, I will, I'm taking you to bed. And he ran right out of his clothes, gone, right? Good lesson there for some of you guys. And she's left holding his robe. And she said, rape, rape, rape. He tried to attack me. And Joseph is thrown into prison. I mean, he's 17 years old, sold into slavery. <laughs> now accused of something he didn't do, and he finds himself in prison. See, if this is me, it's about, God, any time you want to step in here and get involved, that would be awesome, right? But he's in prison, and he meets a couple of dudes in prison that used to work for the Pharaoh, but they had some bad behavior, so they were serving some time in prison. These guys had some dreams. Guess who can interpret dreams, right? So Joseph, he's got like his own little ministry in prison. Yeah, I'll tell you what your dream is. He's interpreting their dreams. Well, these two get back out of prison. They're working for the Pharaoh again. The Pharaoh has a dream of Egypt. And he's like, man, my kingdom, this dream is driving me crazy. And they're like, man, we, we know this Hebrew dude back in prison. He can, tell you, he can tell you what it means. And so they bring Joseph to the Pharaoh. And basically, Joseph hears the dream. He said, well, this is easy. This is easy. You're going to have a time of prosperity, and then you're going to have a time of famine. So I would encourage you, Pharaoh, store up now for the time of famine, and you'll be fine. And he's so impressed with Joseph, he promotes this Hebrew to the second most powerful position in the most powerful nation on earth at the time. Joseph's like prime minister, and he sets up, and, and they, they store up the food, and when the famine hits, no problem, Egypt's cruising right through it, but back in the land of Canaan, where Jacob and the family is, there's no food. So Jacob tells us, boys, you better get on over to Egypt and see if you can find some food, and they show up there, and, 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 and Joseph recognizes them. He's 30-some years old now. They don't recognize him. And he puts them through some hoops, and he has some games with them. And finally, when he can't stand it anymore, one day he empties his house. He tells everybody, get out of the courtroom. Get out of, get out of here except, except these boys right here. And they all leave. And here's Joseph and his brothers, and they don't know it's Joseph. And finally he says, hey, guys, I am Joseph. And they're like, I don't know how you know our brother, but you're not Joseph. I mean, Joseph's got to be dead by now. You don't know what we did to Joseph. And so it says that he, he, he said, hey, guys, come close to me. And all Hebrew scholars, all Old Testament scholars, they believe that he did this. And Joseph brought the brothers close and opened up his robe and showed them that he had been circumcised. 
He was also a descendant of Abraham just like them. By the way, have a good time in the car on the way home today explaining that to your kids that you brought into here with you, okay? That's why they should go to Kid City. I checked. They're not talking about circumcision in there today, okay? Joseph's like, hello. And when they see that Joseph's been, they fall down. They are scared to death. They're like, we are dead men walking. This is what Joseph's like, get up. And he says, don't be distressed and don't be angry and don't be afraid. Why? Because he had already canceled the debt. And then right before Joseph dies, I call it the 50-20 principle. The last chapter of the book of Genesis, his brothers years later are still saying, man, we're so sorry. We still can't believe we did that. I'm glad things are good now, but man, I can't. And he's like, you got to drop it. 50-20, Genesis, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. I love how the New American Standard says it. You meant it for evil, but you know what I've realized? God meant it for good. You know what that tells me? Even with the scars, the hurt, the past, the mess, God can bring something beautiful out of the ashes of our lives. Amen. But you got to do it his way. And that means you cancel the debt and you got to start seeing things from a heavenly perspective. Oh yeah, maybe it was evil. Maybe it was even intentionally meant for evil. But God was up to something in my life. Now, for all of us parents, let me say a few things about us who've blown it, and I'm going to let you out of here. Here's the first thing. Maybe we relate to Jacob. Remember this. We are all imperfect, and that includes our kids. I think sometimes as parents, we, we live under the enormous guilt that if I would have been a better parent, my kids would have turned out better. You know what helps me? Because I'm far from a perfect parent. It, it helps me to remember that Adam and Eve had God as a parent. And look how that turned out, right? My point is this, just like us, our children have their own wills, they have their own sin nature. I mean, to put it bluntly, when our kids are born, they're already damaged goods, spiritually speaking. We saw that last week. They, they've got the same DNA, spiritual DNA from Adam and Eve that we've got, this desire to blame, the sense of shame, our desire for fame, they got the same DNA. And no matter how hard we try, we have to remember that we are dealing with that little person in our home who is far from perfect. And if you forget that, I'm just telling you, you are going to be a frustrated parent. So we are all imperfect. That includes our kids. Second, we can't change the past. And that includes the way we reared our children. Now I'm going to say more about parenting next week, but I'm telling you every parent I've ever met would love to sell away to the island of second chances. We would, we would give anything and go back to relive those years and, and fix those mistakes that we made the first time around. And this brings me to the third observation. And I'll just warn you, this one's going to sting. This is going to leave a mark. Third, when we blow it as parents, we're personally responsible. And that includes mistakes made in ignorance. We're still responsible. For example, if I'm a new driver and I'm not good at judging distances yet because I'm just new at this. And there's a stoplight and I come up behind a car and I don't judge it right. And I don't stop in time and I rear end them right inexperience, when the cop shows up, inexperience will not relieve me from the wrong. And it's the same way when it comes to rearing our children. As, parent, as a parent, I may do the wrong thing out of ignorance, and trust me, I did. But it is still wrong, and I'm still responsible. Now, I'm not bringing that up so you can feel worse about yourself than you already feel. You're going to go home, get in the tub in the fetal position, and suck your thumb all afternoon, right? <laughs> it's just to remind you of this. Blaming someone or something never, never solves the problem. And we're really good at this. It goes all the way back to the garden. We saw this last week. It was the woman. It was the snake, right? And as parents, if we're not careful, we'll find something to be a scapegoat, and we'll blame it. We'll blame it on an ill-timed move. We'll blame it on a time of financial stress. We'll say it's because my mate walked out. Or we'll blame it on them being a strong-willed child. Or they had to go to bad schools. Or we'll blame it on bad habits that we learned from our parents. But we cannot escape the fact that we are responsible for our own mistakes. And I'm telling you, you will never discover the path to recovery and renewal until you face up and listen to the music. 
If you've taken a passive approach to parenting, admit it to your kids. If you've made bad choices as a parent, admit it. If you've been inconsistent, admit it. If you play favorites, admit it. I can't tell you the times I've had to go back and say, guys, I blew it the way I handled that. And they've always forgiven me. See, the good news is this. God holds out an enormous amount of hope and forgiveness if we'll just face the music and if we'll just take responsibility for our actions. And that leads to the truth number four. Because of grace, we have the hope of healing even when we fail as parents. You see, grace reminds me that even though the accident was my fault, it can be taken care of. Grace reminds me, even though I caused a lot of damage by what I did, it can be fixed. Because God's magnificent grace brings the hope of healing. You learn all of this from the story of Joseph. Remember Jacob? His name was changed to Israel. A nation is now named after him. And through that nation came the Messiah and the Savior of the world from this screwed up, dysfunctional dad. There is hope and healing for our dysfunction because God specializes in making beautiful things out of our horrible messes. You got to get to the point, though, where you're willing to say, wow, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Let's move forward. Let's bow. Father, thank you for your incredible grace. And Father, we see this all through the Old Testament and how Paul told us in Romans 15, 4 that the scriptures of old were given to us so that we might have hope. And we, we go back into the Old Testament and this is why it's so relevant in our lives. We read it and we just see the rawness of humanity and how, how you exposed your saints <laughs> with all of their imperfections, and we read them and we learn and we think, man, if Jacob could be used by you, then as a dad, I can be used by you. So Father, I pray that you would, one, just help us to own our mistakes and claim your grace. Be willing to admit wrong. And for many sitting here, the willingness to forgive cancel the debt let it go doesn't mean the relationship's going to be reconciled and restored it may never be but father it will free them up to move forward into a life that brings honor to you no longer feeling the necessity to be a victim of their past their environment their circumstances but a child of your grace and father sometimes we take those scars and you just turn them into beautiful things that we're able to hold out to other people who have been hurt and damaged and say, let me tell you how God brought me through that. And they find hope. We love you. Thanks for being so patient with us. In your name we pray, amen.